Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to a very special Atwater Poetry Project online. We are delighted to be presenting this project to you this evening um, as part of the inaugural Recante Multilingue in Poésie, which is being presented over this week by Montreal-based organisation La Poésie Partie. If you've had a chance to catch up with any of their other events, um, well, you'll know, that you, you'll know they've been great. If not, they're all recorded joys of online events, um, and you'll be able to find them on La Poésie Partie's Facebook book. Uh, Facebook page and on their website and we're going to be telling you more about that at the end and um, so it doesn't distract you but it's very special. Uh, this whole festival has been supported by the Conseil des Arts in Montréal and we are grateful to support from the Literary Translators Association of Canada for this Cabaret de Traduction, which is happening now. It's actually the first of three events um, under that title. If you are joining us from Facebook Live and I'm really hoping it's working on Facebook Live out there and if not we're going to go and hit some buttons in a minute. Um, then uh, I'm so glad you could join us. Bienvenue. Um, vraiment contente que vous êtes ici. Um, however, we can't talk to you on Facebook Live. If you fancy coming and directing some questions to the poets at the end, come and join us on the Crowdcast. You can find the link uh, on the various Facebook pages as far as it goes. I'm Rachel McCrum, by the way. Uh, I'm the curator of the Outwater Poetry Project, and you will hear very little from me this evening, I promise. Um, I'm just here to give you a brief introduction to bring on the poets and then it's all about them for the rest of the evening. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that this event, or certainly the hosting part of it, is taking place on unceded Indigenous lands. Dujage or Montreal is recognised as the gathering place for many First Nations uh, and it is now the, gar gar the guardians of which are now the Kani and Kahaka people. With that, let's get started. This event, Provocations and Mise en Translation, is directed and provoked by Awana Abilisekui. This choral Mise en Translation stages a live reading and conversation between three poet scholar translators voicing, voicing recent translation experiments. Elena Vassili. presents English, French, German, collaborative diffractions of Italian artist Angela Marcioni. Baby Thors. So smooth. Offers her English reimagining of Icelandic poet Kristen Svava Thomas' daughter. And finally, last but never least, Erin Murray will be sharing her Franglish Guarani trans transformation of Brazilian writer Wilson Bueno. Enjoy the show. Untranslatability. Uh, you can't hear well, me. Well, we can now start all over. All right, there was a little blip. Many wary cliches of translatability and untranslatability, faithfulness and betrayal have been claimed for translation. But I want to claim translation as an ethically roused and politically engaged act of interpretation, always in flux, always in process, by which every text, and I do think every text, can be translated because every text can be interpreted. What do you claim? I claim translation as an act of bearing witness to one's own desire as it is triggered by the enigma inscribed in the text of the other. In anyone's language or text, there is always something that is present yet not presented something that inevitably signifies beyond any explicit intention and which can extend into virtual potentialities of another language in unexpected ways. The most exciting aspect of translation as a craft of rewriting lies precisely in tracing the outer contours of this inevitable spillage and virtual excess of signification of the so-called source text, becoming aware of how it touches you and what kind of friction 
or exciting lubrications for that matter, it gives rise to in the translating self. I claim a set of priorities, a version in time, and translation as a tangly read. Now for the drama. Anyareta, anyareta megua. Ever since the formation of these clima of smoke and anxiety of the soul, where does the fit of living come from between prandials and prickles, claws and eggs so well shaped, shapes nearly births of scorpions who emerge already into this world with their raw daggers? What am I talking about? These constant circumlocutions are a cabaret. I observe, here one arrives at supposed happiness, here or là, that toujours inachevable félicité and starts teasing girls, pulling up their jupes and skirts, putting fingers in the recesses of their proffered bodices. Nemo meriha, nemo miri. In my native tongue, things are smallest when they accrete with deaf ferocity. Nemo miri, nemo meriha. When I enter those quadrants of the magnificent mystère de l'existence where the putrid exist, the sordid, the luxuriant, when I inflame myself like this nearly supreme, so many things start to churn again inside and so close to hell, hell exists. Basil of fire and flame, lamplit in the depths of our scorched eyes. And yet at Tamegua, j'ai peur, j'ai beaucoup de fear of what might take place in le futur, of which there's so little here. It might be a miracle, might be l'abyss. Pare piété is the total abyss of the sea. La vérité est que je never know, and this makes me unfailingly afraid. Without the least courage to go de or dans la rue et promenade in my long muslin dresses, my necklaces, bracelets, and mother of pearl with my earrings. Et la fear is a viscous thing that comes from l'intérieur, lentement extending hairy paws, approaching subtly to grab you, en panique to grab you irrevocably by your heartstrings. Some at that moment just kill themselves. And Yereta that keeps on moving. Dieu est-il bon? God, you say? In the cabaret, I sit with the old guy, me, the floozy harlot of the beach town of Quaratuba. And he orders to commencer un verre de minéral, but I note his eyes tremulous. Note the old guy doesn't give a care about the prohibition la plus sévère of the doctor, our doctor, Paiva, who comes to see him once or twice a week. All the old guy, le vieillard, cares about is that the nuit be drunken so as to chase me, to yank me then into bed with his finitude plein de tremors and his sex totalement impossible. Désir persists in the end like an amputated leg that keeps on itching. And yet at the Megua, beneath hell, there's only hell, to see I can dear without fear of a lie. Ma vie inferne, my floozy life of vericosité, cicatrice. La horloge by the window, the curtain shop, late nights of wine, mud on this maison in the beach town of Guaratuba, and le silence blunt breaking and flapping, drip by drip, insistant, recurring, presque dead. The dance enchanté des heures, ah, quel dance, yes, sir, Bob, without the soul of the round dance, the kururu, the karate, and yet at the megua, la tupi africaine dance in the shade, wandering error of lugubriousness, of moths or la pluie on les hivers de mon enfance, of mud, of dust or of human streets, and a village sans change ni destination, ancient house, my tava, my taveaug. We're all frigging alone, and that's the anyareta that lies lower than hell. We die, and it's all scraped into hell. We take to the road dark vagabonds on the byways, ruffians or gigolos, and there hell shows up again and again, et encore l'enfer, hell, anyareta, and wrinkles embed in your face, and your hair turns white, grizzled, and this too is the stuff of l'enfer, the skin of God, these stones, to paita. L'enfer, hell, and Yareta exists and is set against the ski, sea, the sky, lay we mourning rich in sun and sparrows, fruit laden mangoes, given that l'enfer exists, and Yareta, and Yareta megua, and is self sufficient in the pull of its courant, of hard steel and hunger. Yes, hunger for love and affection, but hunger so scandalous that it walks on shards of glass, barefoot and stark naked. Yarobi, 
It's the dance in the abyss of those adept at walking tight ropes. Or so I was told years ago in coarse Spanish by my grandmère Argentine, throwing me into the bitter taste of failure, another nod again and de nouveau at the inexplicable matters of the heart. Is reason on the right or the left? What raison propels that musk, the flesh and blood and thorns? If it weren't for my catin floozy life, the day draw to a close with preparatif for supper avec les kids, with the gentle anticipation of mothers who await their husbands garnishing the meal so lovingly with a tomate cut into flower petals and set in mayonnaise. If it weren't for my floozy life, I'd be the same as all those others, the same as all of them, all those women full of joie and who only run for help from doctors, never psychiatres, who only go when their blood pressure hits the roof. Ah, oh, what a hard way to live. Ah, tekove, tekove miki, tekove pa. And so I brush sometimes in souvent against the mouvement de leur existence that absurdly, even if we don't aspire to it, approaches the hell of embers and cleaver. Hell and yereta exists, and we have to find a fugitive and vagabond façon to fool it, since it's alive in the serpent. Me boy, me boy hovi, coral, coral, me boy chube. And so we have to trick it as it arrives with its ferocious appetite, its bellow, its beaucoup. It's like the whistle of bats, the chauve and dira, I don't even want to know how stupid and dira the ears incapable of hearing and dira the changeable and modular soundings of the bats that draw closer, morbid bat messengers of what hell is. And they know, folks, they know all of it. Hell existed is very much in Nubarable, right up to the rose in the rose in the Guimaris Rosa. Caray. Yes, I'm talking about hell, which always seems to suck until it mutinies. With invincible sensibility, it smashed the bars of its jail and burst out the port, seigneur of martyr and drought, of the great tempête of locusts, to coup locusts, more biblique than all the Judea of the world, to coup this world I describe, Morangu, the borders of death, the l'enfer, and yet a hell that can hide in a pair of green eyes. Hovi, my boy Hovi, that devour you in the kitchen, just like the stars on the telly. Impossible yet concretely present, and with whom we so often make love, eyes shut, solitary in the bathtub of the bathroom, ou alors, as this infernal enfer de hell, and Yareta, and Yareta Megua, my enfer is to possess all the stars, a étoile, every planet of the absolute cosmos, and above all its chalk gray moon right in those green eyes so far from me that remind me of the chanson, green eyes are traitors, les yeux bleus jaloux, brown eyes loyal, beauté can be such terror. A translation is a reading. We can only translate our reading of a text, not a text itself. Text is metonymy for reading, just as the kettle boiling actually refers to water. Indeed, Anya Reta does exist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Um, now, for ages and to this day, translation has been and continues to be treated as a metaphor. But I wish to treat it as a material practice that is inextricably linguistic and cultural. A material practice that establishes a common ground fissured with differences therefore polyvocal and polydiscursive, communal and incomplete, conflicting and at ease with variance. How do you treat translation? As polyvariant, echo musing, polyvocally enchaining, delirious as in lire or reading, presently prescient, a necessary insertion into a receiving culture, exactitude, and fidelity yes i treat it as a form of writing again that wrestles with the originality of authorship and moves in and out of a kind of ghostly consistency until it becomes its own ground for the interpretive work of others new translators in this sense translation is 
iterate, iterative and palimpsestic. It risks erasure and it produces erasure. However, when paid attention to as a material practice of entangled languaging strata, it can produce its own expanded ecology of linguistic diversity. What counts here is neither the adequacy of equivalence nor the closure of interpretive mastery, but the openness of, effective, of diffractive effects of amplification and diminution or interference of meanings always caught in a virtual process of eventful materialization for always new reading communities. Hetu Soler. We seldom imagine how much we have for our carelessness missed until we arrive at the graves of the dead. Misunderstandings that people sometimes in thoughtlessness have about the old times, that nothing can be learned from them. They are like a mistakenly worded sentence that must be struck out most carefully. Snow in most tracks, stories obscured from memory cards. These lines only attempt to save a few remarkable women from the snow. From an early age, she was always there, wherever a new person came into being, caressed all that was beautiful and delicate, the flowers and the lambs and chicks in spring, the calves and foals. Out of childishness and curiosity, curiosity and vanity, coincidence or chance, a solemn vow, a memory of an old dream, mysterious forces, fate, fate, directions in a dream, an elf woman's promise, visits from dead folk, secret sense, inner calling, yearning through some irresistible yearning. She was born for this, to treat and nurse. It was in her nature, the nursing and the healing genetic from person to person. Inborn charity, inborn longing to comfort and nurse the sick, to be there for birthing animals. Longing, longing to learn, longing for broader horizons, longing for a change of scenery, longing to leave home, longing to be something more than a cook, compelled ever on. Learning nonsense, sheer vanity, such outrageous thoughts back then, girls learning to write. You're not sheriff yet, all will had to be suppressed. Everything had to happen in hiding. Read all the books she could find. Read all the books she could find. Absorbed. Snippets of paper. Pulled together snippets of paper. Old accounts. Feather pen, feather pen of swan leg feather, pen stem of split stick, tallow and fat melted in a candle. The ink soot from the kitchen, the ink boiled heather, calf blood. She was not not a seer when it came to the secret ways of the soul rarely surprised by major tidings, sensed many things, saw through walls and woods and hills, saw further, 
Many things went as she expected. The horse wild with fear, the horse in the river, the horse in the impassable, the horse in the pit, the horse in the peat bog, the horse in quicksand, the horse in wet sand, the horse submerged in the river, the horse submerged in the river, the fleet current rolling the horse in the river, the ice flow swaying under her feet, reciting the Lord's prayer in her mind, do not want to die so young. The Fay will not be saved. Scarp face, steep and high, ocean breakers looking high up in the crags like a greedy tongue, the canyon full to the brim with snow. Suddenly the snow drift goes flying down the sheer canyon slope, under seawater slush, out to the ocean. The Fay will not be saved. Dirt red, slush water. Many had died and it wasn't done yet. They were gone, but dusky wreckage floated down the river. Then there was no electric light from the windows. Then strength and stamina mattered more. Then much was different than it now is. Now all you have to do is press a button, then light comes in all directions. And sitting down at the dinner table in a warm living room, driving a car on smooth roads over bridged rivers from one corner of the country to the other. Young people rolling in modern day wealth will hardly believe this to be true. The difficulty, the darkness of the centuries Thank you. Many people often still read translations as if they were, as if they could be, identical to the source text as if the source text would be a uniform, immutable, and immediately transparent whole, and translation a window onto that totality. I want to read literary translations as texts in their own right, creative, embodied, resourceful, relatively autonomous. Such texts are not just translated, they are written, rewritten. They represent an excess of fluctuating identity positions. How do you read translations? Basically with gratitude and awe at these living human conversations. Um, translations are so overt in looping in other people, other ways of understanding and communicating. I love how they remind me of language and everything I encounter really is creative and fluctuating. Trans translations, yes, are texts, are intercalcations with a uh, destiny of autonomy. I try as a translator to create or to, to manage a space of reading that can both provoke and support the reader as I myself was su supported and provoked by the original text. I try to share musics and sounds and words in a new ambience. Hi. What I'm presenting is uh, are some excerpts from a collaborative work in progress and you will hear tonight some uh, um, recordings uh, of my colleagues. It's a collaborative multilingual project of translating an Italian text by Angela Marchioni uh, titled Cose Cante Perbole into English, French and German. Um, 
I will read only uh, my English, and then there's recordings of French from my colleague Chiara Montini, who translated, and then the recordings of um, Angela Marchioni herself. Unfortunately, the German text, um, because these are works in progress, um, uh, Letizia uh, didn't feel um, ready to share in public yet. Um, written in the aftermath of a protracted illness, uh, the poems uh, by Marchioni enact a generative conversation between the abstractions of math and the polysemic openings of poetic writing. The vicissitudes of a body vulnerable to pain, disease, and the educated guesswork of biomedical protocols constitute the experiential background of the poems, whereas a grounded sense of the deeply enlivening, enlivening dimensions of the aesthetic experience orient the poem towards building worlds government, governed by an ethic of responsive care rather than consumptive views. Marchioni is a multifaceted artist active in Italy since the early 80s, and her art practice includes theater, visual arts, sculpture, multimedia installation, and poetry. The rhythm of her poetry may be best described as a tumultuous cascading of images spilling onto one another in ways that are deeply defamiliarizing as they are insightful once the radiance of their multiple connections becomes perceptible. Dazzlement and disorientation constitute my reactions every time I read her. As frequent in Jean Bermont, syntactical distensions that stretch sentences into surprising shapes force my mind to grasp at straws while I drown in the mu musical flow of the stanzas. When I turn to translating these pieces, uh, an aggressive impulse to parse out each line in a quest to stabilize meaning invariably follows. The challenge of the task dawning on me like a tight cage suddenly sprang up around me and the poem. Then the back and forth negotiations of sense and sound begin with such patient sifting eventually giving way to emerging new patterns and possibilities in another language. As we know, the imperative towards equivalence shapes the outer contours of the process of translation and yet, despite its normative hold, equivalence cannot exhaust the ongoing effects of transformative displacement that emerge every time a translator, a new translator, applies her deep reading, reading and writing skills to a text in transition between languages. These effects may be more accurate, accurately understood as diffractions than equivalents. Insofar as they bear the traces of patterns of interference, amplification, and boundary making that tease out sense making as an open ended and constantly recontextualizing activity. Every translation in the end bears the traces of the singularity of a reader's own engagement. What stands out, what doesn't, what seemingly goes without saying, and then what constitutes at first an insurmountable loss and the strategies for getting around it. Remarkably, beyond each translator's singularity, the multilingual translations that um, I'm working on also bear the traces of intense communal conversations. As Chiara, Letizia and I met regularly over Zoom for months to workshop our text. These extended conversations not only produced an unprecedented deepening of our own understandings of each poem, but instigated lateral conversations between the languages such that they authorized, authorized creative swerves that we may not have considered otherwise. One, theorem of the cell phone. Let us assume that your cell phone is paid for at the simple cost of the relation, not between you and your need for love, but between knowledge and our internal chemistry, and be it illusion to think freedom as yours only, it becomes common when that very same phone unsettles the air and turns it mothringent. And let us further admit it as shared by the same fraternity in constant distractions of climbing shares, forcing into recession the ear's cochlear cavity that grows into a system that governs responses of agreeable fissures in hemispheric dominance, dendrites 
and glutamate lost to Nuchia by a car with her own life. The result be that the living live not of ignorance, nor of arrogance or profit. Théorème du téléphone portable. Soit, par hypothèse, ton téléphone portable payait les simples prix du rapport, non entre toi et ton besoin d'amour, mais entre la connaissance et notre chimie interne. Soit, l'illusion de croire à cette liberté tienne qui devient commune quand un même produit déséquilibre l'air qui se fait paraître et soit-elle admise à partager par la même confrérie en distraction quotidienne d'action à la hausse, le jeu au rabais, l'escargot de l'oreille, conque dresser un système qui régit des réponses d'amen si sûr à dominante hémisphérique, d'andride et glutamate perdu à Lucia par voie des voitures au fond de sa vie, alors que les vivants ne vivent pas d'ignorance, ni d'arrogance, ni de profit. Théorème du téléphonino. Sia, per hypothèse, il tuo telefonino pagato al semplice costo del rapporto, non fra te ed il tuo bisogno d'amore, ma fra conoscenza e nostra chimica interna. E sia illusione credere tu alla libertà, che diventa comune quando lo stesso prodotto squilibra l'aria che si fa matrigna e si ammetta condivisa dalla stessa confraternita in distrazioni quotidiane di azioni a rialzo l'imporre al ribasso, la chiocciola d'orecchio, cavità che salleva in sistema, che governa risposte da menicissure a dominanza emisferica, dendriti e glutammato persi in Lucia via auto con sua vita. Il risultato sia che il vivente non viva di ignoranza né d'arroganza, Nedi profitto. Et toi, de donner de la lumière aux chambres hospitalières des anges, à l'anguille qui tenaille les flancs, dans la matière aérienne de chaque amant de miel, et fondre l'aventure advenue du mal au repos du sommeil. Et tempo de donner luce à l'estance hospitale de l'angelo all'anguilla che attanaglia il fianco nella lieve sostanza di ogni amante di miele e sciogliere l'avvenuta avventura del male al riposo del sonno. Time to give light to the angel's hospitable stanzas, to the eel that grips the hip in each sweet lover's delicate substance and dispel the spent venture of evil in slumber's rest. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Elena and Kara and Aaron, who'll be coming up soon, I think. <laughs> Uh, for sharing such a uh, tremendous work and um, and I would like I want to now have I have some questions that uh, you know so that we can talk a little bit further about uh, these texts these uh, living texts that uh, living words that you've presented um, so maybe uh, maybe we'll start with a question I had for Aaron in your commentary to Paraguayancy, which by the way, um, I highly recommend. It's put up by Nightbulb Books. Um, it's available from various sources out there. Um, so in your commentary, you mention um, the, what you call tensilities that exist between Mar Paraguayo's three languages, Spanish and Portuguese or Portuñol and Guarani and the rhythms that bind them, as well as how the whole book is a 
what you call a moving Paraguayan river to the sea of identities. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you approach these tensilities in your Franglish Guarani version and how your identity agency as a translator might have swam in this Mar Paraguayo. Well, thanks for that question, Juana. I just to start, I want to say the text, Wilson's text is a queer text. It upends languages in favor of language. It upends the idea of sea as well and of uh, and of communicative possibility in so many ways. And I just want to acknowledge before I go on, this is this behind me is uh, part of a, a banner installation that was put around the fine arts and engineering, around part of the fine arts and engineering building at Concordia a few years ago on St. Catherine Street, if you went by, you might have seen it. It's a, a font that's invented by the artist Andrew Forrester who did the uh, installation and it's uh, text uh, from this book. Um, and as well, I want to acknowledge the other artists that I worked with who did the cover image, which is uh, Vita Simon. So I, I think it's, um, because it's like the book is written in language, it's written in Portugal, which is a border language between both uh, um, Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay, Brazil, and Uruguay, Brazil, where, because colonial boundaries are artificial and they're administrative, they're artificial even to the way people settled so that uh, the, this border language arose. Uh, Guarani is of course, one of the major uh, indigenous languages in South America and one of the official languages of Paraguay. Um, and so to try and create this, this sea of language, how to create it for an English language reader, but not have it all be in English. And I just felt, and Wil Wilson felt too, that my position as a translator in Montreal, where there's French and English, and uh, Wilson believed that, that uh, Kanyeka, the Mohawk language was live in Montreal as well. Um, but indigenous languages are much more mixed with the colonial languages in, in South America. The colonization wasn't any better, but it was different. But um, so tr trying to create a text with it, that uses some fr a Fringlish, I had to create a language, Portugal already exists. So I had to, it, it's not Franglais, it's Fringlish. It's, it's for English language readers. And um, I use the Guarani because it's really the source language. It's the language that underlies all these colonial languages. It's the language as the, the character says in which um, when something gets smaller and smaller, the word for it gets bigger and bigger and longer. Um, so it's like Guarani that people can only, start, can only keep themselves existing in language. And I just needed various ways of, uh, of of figuring out how I could play with that rhythm and that music and that sound of of, of water um, in a way that 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 English language readers could actually read the book. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Um, yeah. Well. Um, you know, translations, um, kind of this really goes into uh, a question I had for Kara, um, because I feel translations have this powerful potential of materiality and sonically and socially embodying otherness, which your translation certainly did, uh, Aaron, um, and well, as everybody's is doing, um, by creating this site that has, uh, might have multiple and conflicting interpretations. So, um, Kara, I wonder if you can talk about how you do this in your translations of um, Kristen Zvava Tomas Dotir. I wanted to pronounce her name, <laughs> <laughs> and I also want to I want to mention um, now you read oh. from a new work that's not yet published, mm -hmm. uh, but you've previously translated uh, an earlier book of hers. Um, sorry for the. Uh, that looks like this. Um, it's called Stor Storm Warning, and it's uh, published, it was put up by Phoneme uh, in the US. And so this is also available out there for people Great. to check out. Um, so can you talk a bit how you do this in your translations of Thomas de Thier? For instance, how you might approach syntax, compounds, uh, 
the very title of this book is yeah. Storm Warning, it's a compound. Uh, cultural Geographical Specificities of Iceland and Icelandic. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for grabbing that book too. Um, the number of times I had to via email assure people that like, no, please like stop separating those words out. The title is Storm Warning um, or the the Icelandic title is Storm Vidvorin, which really breaks down like vid is like one of the things vid means is with. So like storm with danger <laughs> basically um, is what that is. And yeah, it was a lot of times, even in a translation-y context, which I thought was, you know, which is interesting because it's, I guess we're working with these computers that are doing this stuff to our material automatically too. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Hetu Smoger just came out in Iceland a couple months ago. And Kristen is a historian by trade. So she wound up, I'll intro this book and then it, it deals with material in a whole other way. Um, so she wound up creating this book of poems entirely out of texts uh, that were published in the 1960s in Iceland, but they were gathered. It's 100 either biographies or memoirs of Icelandic midwives that were working around the island at the end of the 19th century up until mid 20th century. And so out of these three volumes of books that were just called Icelandic midwives, one through three, she took these pieces and created an arc of poems with them, which already is getting material in a sense where she was like cutting and snipping and arranging and creating a general story arc out of the records of these 100 women over these this time frame. So that already is incredibly material. So I'm gonna fixate on the compound because I think it's, it's a great example with the way Icelandic works. Um, and just the eye and her style too. There's a lot of big text play that she does in some of the poems in here, but a lot of them are really stark. And when you're looking at a word, you know, uh, what I love about the compounds is that there's just no wriggling out of them in terms of understanding how things are related or syntax or whatever. It's just this, these letters are all smashed together in a single unit, no matter what. And I like, preserving those elements, especially in, you know, particularly loaded points or, you know, resisting that English or Anglo or whatever it is, resisting the urge to, you know, normalize it or make it what someone would expect. Um, reading from a certain point of view and I guess banking on that the work of that, uh, which gets into the even structure of language itself, or we're actually seeing these ideas or these inventions come into play. And that's really happening in Hetu Sola, where, you know, before these women could go on these just unbelievable treks over these, <laughs> crossing these rivers and these fjords and these mountains to try and help these life continue. Um, there's just the material reality of survival and then learning. So the sense of what is ink made of, who gets to who gets to use the extra calf blood for ink um, historically and the material of that. So with these poems, there's a feather pen or these swan leg feathers. What I love, in addition to reminding readers that like, hey, this might look a little strange, but that's the point. You know, that's what I feel like we should be wanting when we're coming to translation. It's not this washing over. Uh, yeah, or sort of, you know, catering or even pandering, I think. Um, it is a sense of this is different. Of, of Why wouldn't it be? Of course. And if you're surprised, that's sort of on you, because why wouldn't, you know, what what's revolving around what there? Uh, so there's that reminder. But then with this book in particular, given the history behind it, it is just chilling to realize you can feel the inventions almost happening in front of you as you're figuring out, you know, if you don't have a swan leg feather for whatever luxury, you know, whatever reason, well, here's a stick and here's some soot. Uh, and you can see that for primeval, what comes first, the thought or the, the word, um, which I really love. Uh, learning nonsense was another, is another single word in these poems, which I feel like 
the way those sort of compounds, like they can get at personality or sort of tone, like the dismissiveness of, you know, not even bothering to, <laughs> to separate out these words as you're dismissing mm -hmm. such nonsense. So yeah, thank you for this question. I love it. That's my, I won't laugh about syntax, but. Well, no, but it's, <laughs> there's lots to say, but no, no it's, yeah. uh, thank you. Yeah, great. Well, um, I, I want to go to a question for Elena um, before I see also we have a question from the audience. Um, but uh, in your introduction to this um, collaborative project, you referred to the, uh, and I think you might have even mentioned it, the effects of transmor transformative displacement that emerge through translation. And you call these effects diffractions. So I wonder if you can talk a bit more about how you understand this idea of diffractions, particularly in relation to this project, which is actually offering, not only is it offering these concurrent translations in three languages. So the idea is not that, you know, there would be three books published in three different languages, but one book published that contains all these languages. Mm -hmm. um, but also an excess of translational possibilities and meta texts, because there's also these other commentaries and notes and definitions. And uh, from what I've seen of the excerpt from the project. So yeah, if you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, I should, I should say something very uh, uh, quickly about uh, sort of the, the, the project has, you've, you've heard a bit of a, an all old on a, a a U R A oral dimension um, tonight. That is far from for which I have some ideas, but it's far from from ready. Um, today you kind of listen to some more linear uh, recordings, um, but in the in the written uh, dimension that uh, for which we're doing a little work in progress for now. The um, for the review ellipse that will be published soon. Um, we actually, I've been in, in touch with uh, Bilal Hashmi at, uh, at um, Quattro Books, who was very curious about one proposed ellipse, proposed, a journal um, uh, issue that was about annotation uh, and thinking and proposing translation with variance, proposing the idea of how you read through all of the process and you can actually materialize it on the page of seeing the different uh, variants that, that happen. Um, so I have to thank, uh, thank Bilal, who also is going to publish this book as, as you said, as a, as a, as a, uh, a multilingual text. With regards to the question of diffraction, um, basically, it's in contemporary feminist new materialisms, a diffraction is a difference that makes a difference, <laughs> a difference that generates difference. Um, and of course, it's it's uh, it's the 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 sort of the, the 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 early uh, instantiation of this concept have to do with uh, classic physics and then quantum physics. Since uh, diffraction is the way in which uh, a, uh, a wave, when confronted with an obstacle passing through, then produces patterns, uh, different moves, and produce and produce more produces more waves once it has encountered the obstacle. Uh, and and in, in quantum physics, it's uh, in fact it's it's a little more complicated than that because it, diffraction is about revealing that double side of matter that is both uh, particle and wave, right? And, it's, right. and, it, and right. it produces that. So when it comes to thinking it in relation to the process of translation, then there's, there's always this tension, I think, that we, and Erin's Aaron, idea of tensilities is quite something. Um, yes, Karen Barad, of course. Um, the when, when it comes to, to, to translation, there's always this tension between the, the movement itself, the process that as translators, as readers, we go through, and then the, the finished product, right? And the, the, for which you have to put some boundaries or some, but every moment in which you, you start reading, you're, you're actually back into the making of the process, back into articulating those patterns. 
and and the fraction speaks to that speaks to that 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 ongoing uh making of patterns uh that um that then can happen in a, in a tension between what's intelligible and unintelligible, both within sort of what you understand in your, as your own language, but what the, the ongoing expansiveness uh, of of language of languaging. That's another. I think I prefer to talk about languagings rather than talk about language as this thing, um, though we have all kinds of norms that we abide by. And when it comes to this particular um, project, or for example, today I read uh, the the recordings I read had some interesting moments when uh, some translation choices were not necessarily made in relation to the Italian so-called source text, and it was also funny when realizing because this, the the Italian source text was also not necessarily a stable one uh, as some back and forth with Angela, we, we discovered a few things that were, were very interesting. But um, for example, um, in the last poem, um, Time to Give Light, the hospitable stances of agents. In, in English, I, I translated what in Italian is stanza, but in, it means room, as actually stanzas, that in English stands as a poetic stanza. Uh, and that was something that I kind of felt authorized to do through a conversation with my uh, German collaborator, co-conspirator, Letizia, who um, was musing about the differences in German between Zimmer and Raum and the, the different kind of connotations of the word. And then I said, like, why not? Why not? Stanza. Why not use this homonym that seemingly is the same? It's the same signifier, but it signifies completely differently in the two languages and produces something else. Similarly, uh, you know, then you get uh, some problems uh, with the French um, in the theorem of a cell phone. Um, there's a there's a passage that goes that the laria que si the cell phone pollutes the air and makes it uh, matrigna, which is stepmother in English, or it would be belmere in French. So and in French it's 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 masculine. Air is masculine, so it becomes parap, right, as opposed to. And I invented mostrignant as mother lignant uh, kind of the strange uh, complete new word uh, but has things that come together so that's that's the kind of uh, work that came together so. yeah no thank you thank you for that and I think that this idea of you know that you mentioned earlier uh, this basic idea of the difference that generates difference I mean I feel that we've um we've heard that in everybody in the work that everybody's been doing and uh, sharing tonight and um i see that there was a question from the audience uh, one uh, some um someone in the audience uh and it's i uh, i would like to know how you retain the rhythm and connotations of the original poem in translation so maybe specifically about rhythm something about rhythm if you could if you have something to say to that Well, I could I could just start. I I probably said it uh, already, but the I try to translate it, the the reading experience that that I've been able to have the reader, and I don't know. I, I the the reader's experience cannot be very truncated and limited, or it can be an open experience. And I've spent my life reading in um, four or five languages, trying to open up my reading practice so that I'm better able to, to read. And I've also spent time in places to try to learn how people live languages with their bodies in, in spaces as well, um, which which is still imperfect. But it's 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 kind of a way of I want to to bring the excitement and the difference of the, the I like the difference that makes a difference. I want the difference of the original writing to make a difference in my culture. I want it to make a an incision or a cut or something. Uh, on entering into the, the receiving culture, as I was saying, I want to both provoke and uh, support the, the reader to try to to be able to see their own language, their own possibilities in the language, their own literature, 
in a new way because these other things, but these other works have joined it. But the problem is that it's very difficult to publish translations of foreign writers in Canada so that over the years, I, the, um, the publishing system has turned me into an American uh, poet and, and translator because I end up uh, working more there. Um, anyways, it's a, I, I just enjoy translation and enjoy the, those spaces a lot, like trying to recreate that experience and excitement I had in reading the text. And the importance of the body, right? As I feel like that's what you're bringing in, is that it's an embodied experience. Uh, the reading experience is an embodied experience. Oh, embodied absolutely. Experience. And, uh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and, and I read books too through my, you know, allergic queer body, through my uh, um, queered experience of, of the world being, being lesbian. I don't have the, I never got a chance to spend my life setting tomatoes and mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I, I just as a result of my experiences growing up and being alive, I have it, my my body operates in the world in a in a different way. Caro mm -hmm. or Elena, do you want to say anything about? I'm curious. Yeah, I'm curious to hear. I I'm also like pondering. Um, I guess I have been thinking about this partly because of the compounds and because of the, just the length of the average Icelandic word, or perhaps not the average, but you know, a lot of them. Uh, a lot of them are lengthy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's such a syllabic, like the beat is just all in there. And partly that's because, yeah, things are condensed and English still can have that sort of momentum, even if it's not all one word. But still it's just there would be levels of weirdness in english if i were to sort of overphrase things into a way to get to so really the sort of steam going the way that some of icelandic lines do so i've been thinking about that and it feels like i mean there sometimes it's it just is more possible than others but in times when it's not i've been thinking about the sort of just like thrust or like what is rhythm really uh and there's like a thrust and a power and yeah, kind of tone really, um, or sass, honestly. Uh, I'm reminded of, there's one of these lines where there was no word, the, there's no sheriff in the original Icelandic that of like, you're not sheriff yet, these women, you know, deigning to learn to read. Um, it would be sort of like a district manager, you could say a regional manager, which is a very long compound word, but there's a sense of partly those built in words, often they can feel very honorific and very like there's a power there. So breaking down even what goes into a sense of rhythm. Uh, hmm. And yeah, diffracting that through the, the body, this sort of lived, what does it feel like to hear that or be told that or to say that? And I think sometimes the length or the, you know, ostensible sonics are one thing, but sometimes it feels more like the power of that like utterance. And depending on what the other aspects are at play, maybe it winds up just being simple and resounding. And so that's something I've thought of if it will be simple and like resound after, even though the letters are over, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. It does. <laughs> um. uh, with them, um, I have to say that, at least with the, this most, most recent experience, um, I am actually translating into a language I did not grow up with. My first language is Italian. And it's been, a, and this is my first attempt at actually translating poetry, not translating uh, either uh, prose or academic text for that matter. Um, and something that happened and it was incredibly uh, powerful was listening to Angela's early uh, recordings, voiced recordings of, of the poetry. And for me also, for thank you 
Joanna for this exercise because you were the one who invited me here. Uh, there was also this moment of me having to read out loud to myself this. And indeed, again, it's not about so much recreating as much as, in fact, I think what, well, recreating, but not recreating necessarily in absolute relation to the original. At one point, uh, I had to kind of stop listening to Angela in my head and see how what I'm doing functions according to my own rhythm of reading. Um, so there's, there are different phases, I think, that one goes through uh, when, when, when working in this translation. And, and at one point, you just have to make that cut. It's not just a cut of your own in the culture, but you also have to make the cut from uh, sort of the text you're in conversation with, because then you're, you're orienting yourself to a new community of readers. Um, and, and, and that's how to then figure out uh, both the, the surprise element and, and then what, what's, what gives you the most, like what enlivens you the most, yes. Yeah, um, well, because actually this, I want to end with one last question, speaking of community of readers, and because um, I wanted to ask you, all of you, um, if you can talk about why you chose, because in all these cases, it's your, your you know, in translation, uh, sometimes we're given translations by publishers, but, but often, especially with poetry, it is the translators who are choosing the the translations, who they're going to translate. So I wanted to ask you what, why you chose uh, these specific poets. Uh, what's important about making these cho the choices that you're making? And um, maybe even what in your approaches led to these choices, but just, you know, what's important about you choosing these poets? I think I, I'll just say that um, actually this book chose me <laughs> um, many years ago, probably almost 20 years ago now that um, Cecilia Vicuña and another person were um, editing the Oxford book of Latin American verse and they uh, Cecilia asked me if I would translate a few pages of Wilson Bueno um, of, of this book for for that volume, which I, I did and, and Wilson loved it and kept wanting me to translate more. He wanted to read more of, of my translation and he kept bugging me and he kept, I kept telling him there's a lot of challenges to this and I need to have time if I'm even gonna think of doing any more, I don't think I can. And, and he went around, he told everybody that I was translating the book. And then I got invited to contribute to all these volumes that, on the book and on Wilson. And uh, in, in 2010, uh, so I promised him I would eventually try, that I, I was gonna find a way to find time and I would translate it. And um, then in, in 2010, um, Wilson was murdered. And I had made this promise to him that was still uh, pendant, you know, pending. Uh, so in 2013, 2014, uh, when I was right in residence at U of A and I had time, so I had a salary, I, um, I worked out how I could balance the book and make, make it all work. So it's easy to make um, in this language mixture three pages work for an anthology, but right. to make the whole right. book work, is, uh, is quite another thing. And Nightboat was interested in it very early on and um, and uh, Wilson's uh, nephew who has the man just the rights of, of was, was interested. So every, everybody just kind of came together and uh, all I had to do was like get the translation finished, you know. But it was uh, it was something I felt that if, if I, it was a useful insertion into this culture and if I didn't do it, then who would do it? Maybe Elena could do it, but you know like somebody who's kind of working between uh, between many languages, but uh, I thought maybe I should do it. So. And plus I promised Wilson, <laughs> you know, you can't take back a promise to a dead person. No. You just no. have to do it. Cara mm. or Elena, would, do you want to say anything to I'm the sure. choice? Um, so I, I wouldn't say, I'm not a translator primarily. I was a poet who was learning Icelandic and had been recommended some stuff by some other writers, including when like very young 
writer, but it was, you know, it was very old guard. It was very, you know, especially with a language like Icelandic where there aren't a ton of translators, it, there were, you know, in order for things to sort of trickle down, it was someone, basically it was a lot of old guys who had written a lot of books. <laughs> and sometimes I, you couldn't really tell which poem was from which book or I don't know. Uh, so I was looking to learn and I was actually, I was working at Asymptote Journal, Literary Journal and interviewed Sion who's a fabulous Icelandic writer and it asked his recommendations if he knew of any you know younger interesting Icelandic writers who he could recommend and I was particularly interested in women or non you know dudes for lack of a better term uh, just you know looking at the canon and looking at my own education and my own sense of yeah what comes where do feeling out of place comes from and if you're partially, yeah, we're having a queer or rural or whatever the upbringing is, it was like, okay, wait, I can like take the reins here a little bit and look for some other stuff. And Kristen was on a list of names that he provided to me and I did some Googling and Storm Morning had just come out and I opened it in the first poem and that book is called Bubbly in the Vulva. <laughs> and it's a like clap back to this sort of, this old stodgy former ambassador, uh, former in Iceland, who has a language blog where he corrects, you know, he maintains vigilance over the Icelandic language and was giving right. this local reporter shit for using the term bubbly. And right. Christian really went to town with it. And it was this economic critique. It had a sense of humor. It was just, it was just great. So I honestly started translating them because I needed a break from grammar exercises and then wound up with this manuscript that wound up being published. But I do, I sort of feel like Erin said, like it chose me, like it was instant. Um, she and I really just get along. And I've been saying with this new book, I would have been surprised if I didn't at least kind of enjoy whatever next poetry book she had made but it was a thrill to understand the project and love it so much. And it didn't come out as much in the sections that I've read, but there's an awareness of how romantic midwife, especially in, in Iceland, like the word for midwife is Lewis mother. So it's like light mother, mother of light. Like it's been voted on in Iceland as being the most beautiful word in the language and her handling that or like her way of dealing with that in the text is really great. Um, so yeah, I have been lucky in the sense that as a poet, the other translation work that I've done, a Chilean poet, Soledad Marambio, fantastic. And yeah, we were paired. I did a couple of poems for a magazine years ago and just really loved her work. So we still uh, have that relationship, but it does feel like it's no coincidence to me that, um, the thing that I'm using, that I'm interested in using my like native Anglophone, you know, colonial body and situation for is to amplify certain voices or people who are dissenting for this, for one reason or another. Right, great, yeah. Yeah, in my uh, case, uh, in my case, um, uh, Angela Marchioni has been someone that I've, I consider my manager. Uh, I um, I was part of uh, the a feminist collective early in the mid '90s that uh, I worked with uh, while I, when I was still in Italy and working in Italy. And actually, this this work behind is actually Angela's uh, um, work is one of her works. And um, Cosecante Pergole was uh, written ten years ago, no more than ten years ago, and. When she first wrote it and when she first uh, showed it to me, I did have an impulse to translate it and did and wanted to do something with it. Um, but again, I I had just arrived. No, not that I no, I, I've been in Canada now for more than twenty five years, but I, I I still didn't feel comfortable working poetically. Uh, at the same time, I. 
I also wanted to do something other than just trans just me translating. Uh, I've admired I'm, I I and read Erin's work with Chuspato and the kind of work you did back with Peshoa, um, the translations, all this this experimental. Um, expansive or the work of Caroline Bergval, uh, expansive uh, re-articulations of translation as something other than what it's what what is expected to be or what a contract asks it to be. And um, and so I I proposed um, to friends to try and do something with it. Uh, and I do find Angela's work to me uh, incredibly dense and philosophically dense, uh, actually. Um, the reflections on uh, gift giving uh, and yet using the theorem, using this mathematical language, because it can't hyperbole is, uh, has its own other little thing going on. Um, so yeah, there is. There's always. I think at, at one point there is this. Uh, you want to love or or feel the challenge of what of what of what's being um, offered to you, and you want to offer it to others, and you want to make it available to to others. Um, I no. I'll stop it here because. I don't, I don't, yeah, no, but you know, the gift gift is a nice is a is a good is a good word to end on, I think, and making making available to others and uh, sharing this. And we are um, out of time, and I so I'm though I would like to keep keep speaking with you all. I I feel we need to end the evening. Um, uh, there was a couple of questions just uh, in the from Arena uh, about clarifying things that. You, a couple of you have said earlier, but I would actually like to remind everyone that uh, within a few minutes after we finish, this um, event is going to be available for playback at the exact same link. So you can both, uh, you know, re-listen, re-watch, uh, but you can also share it with others who didn't get a chance to see it. Um, that's totally possible. So, and um, I would also like to say to uh, mention that uh, there are this this event is the first part of a three evening um, cabaret de la traduction, and there are two other events um, organized by La Poésie Partout. Uh, there are two other events tomorrow night and uh, the night after. They're all at 8 p.m. The one tomorrow night is called Dislocution, and it was curated by Olivia Tapiero, and um, the one on Thursday is called Mask, and it's, it was curated by Catherine Ego. And um, Rachel uh, is putting up some, you can see the link in the chat uh, where you can find out more about these events. And just in closing, uh, I would like to really thank you, um, Elena and Cara and Aaron for um, being wonderful participants, um, presences uh, this evening. And I would also like to thank uh, Rachel McCrum and the Atwater Poetry Project for, uh, well, Rachel, first of all, for being the um, kind of magician pulling the strings um, yes. of the screens. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and also Jonathan Lamy of uh, Poésie Partout, who uh, invited me to um, put this event together. Uh, so thank you to La Poésie Partout and to Jonathan Lamy. And last, but very much not least, I would really, uh, a warm, super warm thank you to all of you out there uh, who have listened and shared. And um, thank you for all your comments and for being present with um, these wonderful translations. So I wish you all good night. And thank you, Juana. Yes, thanks, Juana. Yes, thanks, Juana. That was fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.